Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Royal Philatelic Society of London. I'm just astonished that so many people haven't got anything better to do on such a glorious day as this, but there we go. <laughs> My charisma, yes. I suspect it's something to do with uh, Gordon Stamps, actually, but let's not go into that. Um, this covers more of this stamps, I beg your pardon. Uh, Mr. Coburn. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Very nice to see you all again, and a particular welcome to Gordon Eubanks. Um, when I um, arranged to meet Gordon at 12 noon in the lobby, uh, I was got my shorts on and I was all ready for a fight, but um, turned out that was... Um, <laughs> That was Gordon and not Chris. Anyway, we had a lovely lunch and it was a very pleasant, very nice to see you, sir. We have 90 fellows and members here today. We have three guests. We have Gordon himself from the USA. Uh, we have Vincent Schubrix and Van den Marken from Belgium, along with our vice president, who um, from time to time we need to acknowledge. And. Um, we have uh, Achis Christou from Cyprus, and we have a gentleman called, uh, is it Julude Maras from Croatia? Julio Maras, welcome to you all. <laughs> I'll do the fire notice in just a minute, but um, during the week uh, or the fortnight past, uh, it was my very pleasant duty to send a note along with a gift which we have sent for the 90th birthday of Her Majesty the Queen. I wrote to Sir Christopher Gid, Gid? Michael's not here so I can't ask him. Get him, yeah. Uh, and uh, I sent him a, a letter on behalf of us all wishing the Queen a very happy birthday, but also sending a very interesting document um, which, of which this is a, a photocopy of the first page. Um, it was a, a philatelic literature biographical, a bibliographical index, uh, which was originally prepared by a Mr. William Ricketts of the United States in 1912. And it was originally to go to uh, His Majesty King George V, who was, of course, at that time, um, had just ceased to be our president, but became our patron. For some extraordinary reason, it was never delivered, so we thought it was appropriate that we should deliver it now. And um, so we did. And I said uh, to uh, Sir Christopher that recently this document came to light and into the possession of the society, and we are honored and delighted to be able to present it to our monarch, all be a little late. <laughs> and finally, the fire notice. Now, I don't know whether all of you, any, any of you know, but um, our guest, Mr. Eubanks, um, has spent a great deal of time in software. Um, and I don't mean Marks and Spencers. <laughs> but um, he, he's a very distinguished um, uh, software designer and, and, and businessman. And of course, that has a great deal to do with virus detection. So I just want to make absolutely sure that this notice is not a spoof. And of course, if you need to go, you have to go, you have to go quickly, you have to go that door or that door, and as you know, you come bound. Having passed Sir Daniel Cooper in photograph, you then meet him in effigy, and then you come down out of the door, turn right, straight into the pub, and Patrick Marcellus is buying the drinks. <laughs> Any questions about the fire notice? <laughs> Ask me afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> I think for the first time ever, I did actually get a question about a fire notice myself this afternoon. I was explaining to Gordon, uh, just the running Gordon, he says, OK, he says, Frank, I've got that, he says, but where are the keys? 
<laughs> so if the fire drill goes, be prepared to get some bricks in the glass. <laughs> um, Gordon Eubanks, I, I, I've had a little look at this stuff, and it's absolutely amazing. So I'm delighted that you've come here today, and we'd very much like to hear your talk. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, thank you. I, I don't need to say what an unbelievable honor it is to be here. I mean, it, it really is. This is the ultimate of the philatelic world to get a chance to speak here. Um, I could speak for hours um, on, on these, these stamps, so I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to do that, but there's a couple things I want to get across. Um, you thought it was going to be about U.S. stamps, right? Um, first, I'm going to talk about this issue of stamps, and, and the basic theme here is it's a lot harder to make stamps than you think it is. Ask these people who bid on these contracts. And uh, the second is talk about how important these stamps, this issue was to the, the country, the United States, and the world economy that we didn't use a lot of email in those days. We, we really wrote letters, and that's how commerce flowed. So we'll talk some about those two things. Um, these are the five stamps. This is a pretty, at first glance, a pretty ugly look at it. The one in the upper left is a, a type one. We'll talk about why these types. This was a, a dealer thing to get more differentiation and value out of the issue, I'm sure. The, the middle, the three cent has a supplementary mail cancel. That's unique. The 12 cent we'll talk about. That's a, an unused that 55 is a beautiful mint full gum copy. I don't know how I ended up with that. And then the 56 uh, 5 cent. So these stamps were to support a low postal rate. You know, we kept driving them down following the UK that was absolutely the leader in this area in every way. Um, and they gave it to a banknote engraving company that I really believe thought, how hard can it be? We make money. How hard can it be to make stamps? But, and they had no experience and no understanding, and it created a lot of interests and challenges in the issue and created all these varieties and, and other things. So this is, um, these, this, I don't have these pieces here because they're on double pages, um, and United Airlines hasn't really designed the plane for double pages. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, the, the G4 was being worked on. So, um, yeah. so this is, uh, it shows you how tightly they were spaced, in particular the one cent. I mean, it turned out that they committed to a design and a size and then had to get it to fit on existing plates. And, and this caused a lot of problems. Um, and... Uh, it took them really till 60, 1861 with the, the new issue to really recover from this. So this gives you another picture. So notice the five cent, which were printed uh, five years later, that they did a little better job of spacing them. Um, they're not all plated, so it's not plated. You can see, though, if you really look, I love to use these pointers. I mean, there is very little space here. If you can imagine trying to run perforating machines in two directions through there, um, a difficult problem. And what that meant was that particularly with a one cent, there was a bunch of types. So here we have four plates and a reworked plate. We have types 1, 1B, one 2, 3A, 2, again, 4, 1A, 1C, 3, 3A. All these different types of the stamps are all to do with some manager saying to this engraver and, and the team that does this, I don't want to hear that. I want you to get those things onto the plate and start printing these stamps. You can imagine that's how business works. There's like, I, I mean, if you have to cut it off a little bit there, if you have to do what you need to do. And I'm sure they were told, well, we really need to redesign this. We're not going to redesign the stamp. We're going to make it fit. And so you end up with all these different... Um, types of, of especially the one cent. And some of the early students created these types by identifying them, therefore, of course, created a lot of rarities that way. Um, at the same time, stamp demand was going crazy. 
Um, it's exponential in the US. I'm sure it was the same way in the UK. Um, and and they were driving to make it mandatory. The US took the wrong road. It didn't follow the lead of the UK and, and, and really just bite the bullet on day one. So we went through it step at a time. First you had to prepay, then you had to prepay with stamps. Um, the post office had to have that to make it work for the low cost postage. So we ended up partway through changing some of the rates and, and introducing some new stamps, the 10 cent and the 5 cent. It's, it's hard to say why we, we introduced the 5 cent actually. It's not because of registration, the 5 cent registration fee, because you weren't allowed to pay that with stamps. Matter of fact, you weren't originally allowed to say registered because it would draw attention to the value of the letter. It's in interesting. So all these one cent types, short transfers, recutting, getting it to fit. I don't think it's all that important, except if you own some of these particular positions, it becomes important. <laughs> so I, I want you to just look. So the upper left is the, I made the mistake once with Rich Drews of calling it the complete design. And I, 20 minutes later, I understood to not ever say that again. Um, even though the, the gurus and Newton, all these guys would say that, I don't say that, but it's, that's what the design is. Those on the, are the positions across the top plate, three, four, five, six, eight, and nine, that are on either side of the complete design. Uh, now, can you see the difference? But I can tell you they make a big difference. This, uh, if you're trying to buy one of them, this is the type one. Here, this stamp here, this, it's the color, it, this is what the stamp really looks like, the, the, the covers in the far left frame. This is type 1, type 1B, type 1B. Very, very minor details in these stamps. I think they're just as beautiful, whatever type they are. But this is how it started. Type 2, I apologize for these scans, or, um, but type 2 has the, um, uh, the design at the top and incomplete at the bottom, outer line, you know, it's this stuff. So this is what is interesting. So this is an example of a real plate where they, they took the plate one, the original plate one, they're having some problems, so they took it off and reworked it. And this is the uh, uh, almost complete plate. And on the right, you can see the different kinds of work they did. So double cuts at the bottom, one at the top, two at the bottom, two at the top, two at the, the different, and then the color coding here to see that they virtually redid almost this whole complete with, to try to get it to print better stamps. And then also, in some cases, they erased effectively the image and put a new image on in the positions. And of course, there are a few plate cracks. So, the, the one cent stamp is riddled with these issues, but they all look beautiful to me. I'm not going to go into this because I'll run over the 30 minutes, but there's then in the later plates, plates three and four, when they started making them, not only were they told to get them to fit, but they said you need to be prepared for perforation. So they did some more work and, and created some more types. Um, if you find one of these types, you're, you're glad they did this. But this, though, is another really interesting plate. Plate two had this crack from almost the beginning, virtually the beginning. You could see it forming. And yet, this pl plate never was taken out of service, or not for a long, long time. They made perforated stamps with it, and that's pretty defective. Yet, plate three which had no real logic to why. You can see on, over there some of the plate three stamps. They, had, they do have surface cracks, but they, had no, they in no way impacted the use of the stamps or even the appearance. You have to really look to see the surface. They took that out, just took it out of service very quickly. Never printed perforated stamps with it, but they left this in. This is, this is quite a, it, it's amazing this piece exists, that, it, that someone retained First of all, that's what, eight, uh, what, 12 cents? It's a lot of money to be just sitting in your drawer. I had an antique 
in Monterey, California, an antique dealer called me and said, do you know anything about these blue stamps that show uh, Franklin? I said, I, found, I have an old chest and I found a, a big piece of them in, in the drawer. True story. So I raced down to the there, looking nonchalant, and, <laughs> and unfortunately they were covered with varnish and they were, they were just type two stamps and they were, but I envisioned like the plate one early, the top half or something. <laughs> okay, the three cent, not types really, there are some types that have to do with frame lines, but it's really about color. So play, the one cent, Lots of issues getting them on there. The three cent, they had a real corrosion problem. So um, this is, a, I think, a very nice uh, orange brown. It's the color they started out making for this stamp. Um, and it was used in, in large volume and increasing volume. And the orange brown, they felt, was corroding the plate. So they changed the color. And they're actually a bunch of colors. So again, one cent. Uh, a rarity or unusual has to do with these types. Here it's the color. This is uh, my favorite uh, cover in the three cent just for the stamps, the plum, beautiful shade. There's some others that are even rare, pinkish. Now, now let's think, do you think that the printer sat there and said, we need to have a few colors. So, so like with, uh, what are those cards kids collected? The, the, the ten, um, Pokemon, you know, they, they made some rarer than others and baseball cards they made. You think maybe they made the stamps, we'll make a few pinkish cause that, and that'll be a, of course not. They get it in the morning, they got a bin ink, they stir it some days, maybe they stir harder than others. I, I, these colors are an artifact of processing these things. But for the, this issue, the stamps, you got to look at the, the 12 cent on the other hand, one plate, some re rework, but not much. This is a particularly large 12 cent piece. Um, on all these, I have references on the handout of where is the best. In this case, uh, Jim Allen's exhibit is, is the reference for this stamp. Um, the interesting thing here is that this is position 61 and that's position 51. So what you say is, wow, they, uh, they left the imprint off that that stamp, they must have, uh, must be an error in printing. But actually what happened with this stamp and the early stamps, they didn't put in prints or plate numbers. They just made the stamps. And this is the proof, this piece here, coupled with, there's a number of pieces that show the imprint. But this, there's I believe two pieces. I believe there's one piece in the uh, Swiss Museum and, and there's this piece, that's an unused, that's got full gum. Another miracle to survive. But they obviously took that plate and added the imprint at a later date. There's also, and I apologize, the handout has a different picture for this page. Um, the 12 cent bisects are, are, are really something that are uh, um, an interesting story. Bisects were never legal in the United States. They did in, in later on, 55, 53, I believe, say no more, no more bisects for sure. But they were never said they were illegal, but they, they were used occasionally. San Francisco ran out of stamps. And so they would um, they'd bisect them, charge six cents. Do you know why the post office so was against bisects? I mean, why would they care? They cared because if it was canceled on one half, you could make a whole six cent stamp. Um, these are smart people back in those days. This is a, a very attractive cover. It went from San Francisco to New York to Boston. It, this bisect was accepted by the San Francisco Post Office, the New York Post Office, and the Bo Boston Post Office. Um, and uh, I have examples of ones that weren't accepted in the exhibit also. Ten cent. This is another different types, how the plates were laid out. So there's basically um, one, two, and three. And then type fours have to do with recutting the stamp after the plate was made, going in and reinforcing 
some lines on the stamp. So there's four different uh, um, types. Uh, the printers were getting better. This was issued in 55, 1855, so this is four years into it. They've been making one cent and three cent plates, um, adding to that. They were getting better. This, this is a much cleaner. I have to say, um, this is the, the, in my mind, the nicest individual stamp piece. This has four of the um, type four, the, the, where they're recut in, in there, in addition to um, a type two and a type three in one block. Um, and, um, but these stamps, you can see the spacing looks decent, right? This is, is showing that they were learning. And this shows the recut. The final stamp that, that was in only imperfect use for just a few months, the five cent, and there's almost no varieties. By then, there was the one defective transfer in one position on that plate, and the rest of it was very clean. Um, I guess the weak double transfer is on another. But they were very uh, well done and improved. And this is, um, someone hadn't cut this thing in half would be by far the largest known block. I pretend they didn't cut it in half, but I think we can agree it was originally one piece. Um, beautiful, I, I like this stamp. I think it's an attractive stamp. So I wanna change uh, to a different topic. So the stamps are kind of interesting. They're interesting to collect. There's lots of varieties, there's rarities, but What's really important is what, what they were doing with the mail. And, and here's the country in the 1850s. This was a big area. Now that middle area with a lot of territories, some of that area was uh, hostile. It was uh, not necessarily a good idea to be going across there. Getting the mail was a risk. And, but we had this large area and the mail was the way we built the economy. That is what I think is so important about this issue. It's the postal age. It's when the post office became the driver in economic growth. I mean, we can have beautiful covers, we can, but, but, it, but thinking past it, here we are building an economy in this country and many other countries. And the other thing about the US that is lucky is that the, the tremendous river system that we're blessed with. There's a, a book out a few years ago about how our rivers coupled with our big coast protects us and we have friendly people in the south and the north. We try to make the friendly people in the south not so friendly, but they're actually, we're lucky to be in, a, in the position we are geographically, but the rivers were immense uh, advantage for the postal system. So what the U.S. Postal Service did with the issue of 51 was they invested heavily in technology to get the mail through. They invested in railroads, they invested in ships, and in, in the ability to move the mail over a very large area. And, and this is, as I said, I call it, I think of it as the postal age. It went on really until the 18, early 18, 1950s where the post office was the dominant source of communication. All, I wrote, wrote letters as a, you know, as a kid and as a young adult, I'm sure. And businesses, that's how they communicated. Um, when I first started out in technology, I mean, we used the mail for a lot of stuff. Um, so the, this is a couple of examples of interesting just General letters, under 3,000 miles. The fancy cancels are a whole area unto itself. Um, this is a, actually it doesn't maybe look that way in the picture. It's a very nice example of the running stag. And then in New York, this is the first real date that was used in a, in a big city in a postmark. They used this for a couple weeks this 1853 year date, and then they just quit using it. Um, but again, just sending a letter. 
um, a triple right ladder, unusual with a 10 cent stamp. Must be unusual because it looks like it's about falling apart. I mean, it was a <laughs> could not find a better example. And then the 12 cent uses a 4x right. Um, people wrote, this is a letter, the, the top letter is going to a fort uh, in um, Brownsville, Texas. Brownville, it's, it was called Brownville then in Texas. This was a person deployed, forward deployed to a remote fort. This is the way they communicated. And then to get mail across the country, it wasn't really practical to go the 3,000 some miles across the, the plains and then try to cross the mountains. It was uh, difficult and dangerous. So there were two competing lines that were built. Um, the government supported and gave the contract to the Panama route through, down to um, Aps Aspenwald and, and across the Panama, can I, across the Isthmus of Panama. This sounds easy, but if you, I mean, people would take a boat down there, they'd cross this isthma and go back, or either way. The person who actually was driving the Cross Continental Railroad, uh, whose name escapes me, actually died on the, the transit of Panama trying to get back to New York to raise money for the, uh, the railroad and, and the, the, trying to get this cross country railroad funded. And eventually they put railroads. Meanwhile, um, the Nicaragua route, Vanderbilt put up in place in the true entrepreneurial spirit, his own railroad, I mean his own uh, shipping line and, and uh, transit across Nicaragua because it was shorter and faster and created some beautiful postal history because of it. I mean these ahead of the mail, the Via Nicaragua, all that was created as a business opportunity and without dwelling too much on it. The reason he walked away from Nicaragua had to do with um, a guy named Walker. Do people know the term freebooter? This was the idea in the United States that private people could raise an army and go take over another country. Walker invaded Mexico, Cuba before he ran into a problem in Nicaragua. Can you imagine? And you wonder why, we wonder why some of these people don't really like us. Um, but <laughs> but, but uh, Vanderbilt, in great credit to himself, when, when Walker went in and took over the country and tried to hardball Vanderbilt, he just walked away. But for a long time, that was the fastest route. Um, so here's an example of going, this one went over the, uh, through the Panama route by the government, particularly unusual to see a block of four. Um, I'm sure that the postmaster sat there and worked on that cancel. And then in, in 55, they raised the rate to 10 cents for the same service. And uh, you rarely see the five cent stamp used in that way, but same service, this one was going um, via Panama again. It was a, entered the mail in New York, uh, in Auburn, went down to New York City, the boat to Panama and through. Um, at the same time, because of the, the need, the commerce, the, the link California to the east, there was a lot of printed matter. The top one is a, a, basically a newsletter about commerce in San Francisco. And then the bottom one is another piece of uh, printed matter that was an advertising that went uh, to Boston via, via Nicaragua. All the Nicaragua, all the Panama went into New York and then from New York it was distributed by the postal system. So the letter on the bottom via Nicaragua never touched the postal system until it got to New York. Right, it was via New York, uh, via Nicaragua. I have one of these with a three cent bisect on it too. That's the same via Nicaragua marking that's somewhere over there. And newspapers, again, printed matter sent um, in the mail. 
This was a, a wrapper that had that paper stuck in it. Um, and it was found, but it, it was found recently, you know, in the last 15 years. Up to then, we, we had no idea why we, there would be these two pre-canceled stamps. But you can envision that to try, as the volume came up, to try to get this information out, people were printing their own cancels and, and using them and working with the postmaster, getting them to accept it. The type that is on those pre-cancels is the same type that was used for the newspaper. And no doubt the publisher of the newspaper would periodically take a couple sheets of stamps, print them. They're in different, I guess he didn't have as many capital P's and A's and I's and D's, I, I, you know, something. Um, again, today you can only imagine that the, the government approval would be decades in the making. <laughs> to, but here, the people had this incredible drive to get this stuff done and to be, use common sense. This is an example of common sense. Um, and then the U.S. started driving very hard on perforations. Businesses were asking for perforations. And this is a dentist in Chicago who went and, and studied this problem, built this machine, did his own perforations for a while, trying to spur the government on. I don't think he ever really wanted to be in this business, but he, he sold stamps locally around his uh, area in Chicago. And this particular guy, Mr. Parker, was in Chicago, wrote to his wife, you can sort of see Friday morning, this, he wrote this letter to his wife with the Chicago perf on it, went to Boston for more business, and wrote his wife a second time with the Chicago perf on the letter from Boston. I think that's very, one, of course, it's, there's only a couple that are outside of Chicago used, but so by 56, the volume of mail was such that business people who depended on the mail, wanted the government to do something. The government is trying. They come over to England. They study the perforating machines. I believe they bought some. They ended up not buying this guy's design. They bought the English design. And were, but, they, but the US had this problem, which was it's hard to perforate the stamps that are so close together. So eventually, they got that taken care of. So, if you stop here for a second, interesting stamps, driving commerce, especially in the East, and linking it to the West where there was because of the gold rush. But meanwhile, in the gold country, um, there were districts. And so there were a few big cities, and eventually we got post offices. We had them in San Francisco, and eventually Sacramento, and Stockton, Marysville, and, and up in Shasta. But the mines, which you get a better sense of on the right, these mining districts were up in these rivers. And if you, if you want to get a sense, you can go there today. I'd be careful. These are people who don't really like visitors, so still live there. But you can go up in these mountains, and, and these towns are literally, you know, hikes over mountains to get to them. And that's where all the miners were. So there was thousands and thousands of people going to California, going up to these mines. There's a great picture of all these boats that were just abandoned in San Francisco. Dozens and dozens of sailing boats that came in and the crews abandoned and went up there. The post office had absolutely no way of serving these people. It just, they couldn't set up hundreds of post offices in towns that most people had never heard of. So, uh, an entrepreneurial system grew up. This is another, you could have a whole lecture on just these expresses where people would start a business and carry the mail to the post office on behalf of a person and charge them. They would charge them a lot of money, like 25 cents, and some of them they charge a dollar. And that was like serious money in those days. And they would, so this whole entrepreneurial, completely unofficial system 
grew up in California in a matter of months and served the major post offices and served the people up in the mines. And like I say, there's thousands and thousands of, of different uh, examples to study, but this is a particularly nice example from Red Bluffs, a double rate letter up in the northern mines, carried to San Francisco where it entered the mail, went through Panama and up to eventually got to Wisconsin. So it went down, through, and then across to Wisconsin, not an easy trek in itself. So these were really a, an important part of the, this time frame and the issue. This example is interesting because it was carried all the way to New York privately by an express company. And um, the Pacific Express took it on a ship through uh, Nicaragua, got it to New York, and it entered the mail in New York. Now the post office probably knew this was illegal. It was violated the law. You can't compete with the post office. All these services. Um, but as long as you paid full postage, they were smart enough to say, well, wait a minute. This is almost as good as collectors who buy them and never use them. <laughs> Same difference. I'm going to look the other way. If you did this in the east, they would have arrested you. And they, and they did. But um, on, in the west, they, they this system enabled the miners to connect. So there was also a robust effort to get mail outside the U.S. because of business. And Canada is a special case. We've been working with Canada through um, exchange offices for, since the 17, late 1700s. And so this was a very long-term relationship. It cost 10 cents in this period, 51 to 56, 10 cents to go to Canada. Um, and 15 cents if it was from the West Coast. There was a five cent West Coast surcharge that was added to the rate. Um, if, the, if from Canada, it, it was the same thing that Canada collected the postage in Canada, we collected it in the US. This is one of the truly amazing Canada covers that exists in in U.S. philately. So here is a, two letters written about at the same time from Cuba. Put on a ship, carried privately, probably not legal, into New York. A clerk in New York had to get these in the mail to Canada. So the New York clerk had a 12 cent stamp and had a block of eight of the one cent stamp. Now he may have had more, but he at least had that because those two one cent stamps were cut diag uh, horizontally and the 12 cent stamp was cut diagonally and put on that letter and put in the mail. And this was a very early use. This is in uh, 51. This is one of the earlier uses of the 12 cent stamp period. I, I just find it amazing that these survived. And if you know the story, two different people owned them and didn't realize until at some point they put them together. Um, and uh, I uh, managed to outbid some other crazy person for these covers, <laughs> truly. And Scott's there, go, go, go. <laughs> now here is one from Canada where someone put a block of four of the three cent stamp on a letter in Canada, clearly from Canada um, again, canceled the order. It was very nice of that postmaster to do such a nice job. And he accepted it. Completely illegal. Now, there's a famous beaver covers with the 47 where the law was not clear, so they, they weren't um, uh, illegal. This is clearly illegal. Clearly should not have been accepted. But the postmaster accepted, maybe because it was so pretty. And the U.S. postmaster also accepted it using what I believe 
is a, a common sense that we've lost in the world that they looked at it and said, we've been paid 12 cents, so what in the world would we do to reject this letter? I, I mean, I, I, that's what I think happened. Now, Canada, it's harder to explain because they did not get paid for that letter. But clearly it was uh, canceled there in Ontario. Here's an example going to New Brunswick from the West Coast, paying the uh, extra, fifth, extra five cent uh, West Coast. Um, and uh, it's a very pretty cover. So how am I on time? Okay. So internationally, the U.S. had some growing number of treaties. And um, most mail, though, for commerce took advantage of an incredible system, which was the British postal system. So we had treaties. We could send them a lot of different ways. We finally got the treaty with France. And so, but at the end of the day, you could send a letter anywhere by just putting five cents on it and sending it on a British ship. It would go to the UK and it would get anywhere. And we didn't have to pay for it. It, it, was, a, it was a wonderful system that, that existed at, by this time. And then there were the private ship letters that, that occasionally came in and were charged as ship letters. That's been going on for have been going on for quite some time. So here's an example that was uh, owned by uh, Steve Walski before me. Here, here's an example of, of a letter going to the UK, going to London from the West Coast, um, paying the surcharge, so five cent surcharge, 24 cent to, the we to, to London. I don't know if they get prettier than this. I, he could have kept the 19s a little straighter and a little darker, <laughs> um, you know, but not bad. And the uh, letter got wrinkled along the way. But th this is uh, one of my favorite letters to London. Now, this is a, uh, what, what, let's say, ugly. <laughs> this is not a, uh, Treppel would describe this as pristine, but. Um, <laughs> using the sliding scale of, uh, but this is a, a really interesting letter. This went from New Orleans, from Veracruz, Mexico, to New Orleans, to Paris, via Livermore, again taking advantage of the British open mail, this time going on an American packet, therefore you had to prepay the 21 cents to London, and the rest of it was paid by the recipient. But what's really unique about this letter that I have not seen another example of is it got to Paris and it was forwarded back to the UK and therefore got the British foreign at the bottom with the breakout of the payment. Um, that is, again, not a pretty cover. Hardly call it a cover, actually. Maybe a, a cover something. And, but very unusual marking. I, I, I've never seen that on a US. Um, because the situation, I'm sure you have seen British foreign markings on letters here from, that are forwarded from France, but, but not that start in the U.S. If someone has one or knows of one, I'd like to be sure I'm not overclaiming. So this is a letter that kind of ties the beginning of our conversation to this. This is a pretty letter to, to Switzerland, um, British open mail again took care of getting it to Switzerland. And um, this was on the cover of one of Scott's catalogs. I guess he thought I should be looking at this. But the thing about this letter is that there's probably hundreds just like it, except the stamps are type 1B. So this is, again, go back to the beginning. Remember, there's difference. So this is very, you know, it's a pretty, pretty, looks attractive, but those happen to be type 1B stamps uh, from the top row of the first plate of the one cent, and therefore makes this different than one that didn't have those. 
is, is that important? I guess, I hope so when I go to sell it. But, um, <laughs> and another one of my favorites, um, this is Prussian clothes mail, much less shoes. This is a letter from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Now, there were famous cowboys hanging out in Santa Fe in these days. I mean, this was not, you know, this was not New York City. Um, the army had to escort this across the plains because it was too dangerous to send a mail rider. Um, and it has the Santa Fe balloon. I'm a little unhappy with the postmaster. Could have made a much better strike. But... This is um, a double rate, double the 30 cent Prussian clothes mail rate from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, I just marvel at such things. And you think 60 cents in those days, I mean, that was like actual real money. And I don't know, I just think this was you know, you really have to wonder if this is real. It looks so like, and if you see it in the frame, it's brand. It's just to the left of Patrick there, somewhere there. Um, it's underneath the block of six of the 10 cent stamp. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful uh, strike. Again, going by a more unusual way, the Prussian closed mail. It's a single rate, 30 cent. To I love this cover. There's a mate to it that's in Europe somewhere that's paid with um, a 12 cent and um, two, two threes. I've been told, I've never seen it. But uh, the same correspondence, the same handwriting. These people learned how to write clearly and high quality paper, so it preserved. And this is, uh, I think, my final example of why the British open mail was so unbelievable. I mean, how do you get to Hong Kong? And then there's a, a, there's a couple other China covers in the collection that you couldn't do it any other way. Um, I mean, you just, you just couldn't. It was nice that the person sent it by US packets, so they paid 21 cents of the postage. But this, once it got there, the system of peninsula, uh, peninsular and oriental steam lines. I think I, on this one I figured out the ships that went on. Um, I have one that I have found a little harder to do that. So, th so that's a, a quick summary of this. Um, you can't cover all aspects of this flatly in, in 30 minutes. What, we ha what I have here is the whole exhibit minus 28 pages. There's four double pages and 20 pages. I could have brought three more pages, but I didn't want to overflow the uh, allotment. But uh, this is the, uh, I'm going to have this in New York. The one question I ask, or the one request I have is, if you see something that's wrong, or you even think is wrong, drop me an email. I really like to know, honestly. I'm not going to yell or feel hurt. I mean, if, if something's not right, and do you think there's something wrong here? Of course, somewhere. There's, there's bound to be things that aren't right or could be better. So I pre if someone sees something, don't feel embarrassed to say something. My email is my full name. I meant to put it on the, is it in, I think it is on the handout. Is it on the handout? Too? Yeah. So feel free. Um, and I turn it back yep. to you. Thank you. Uh, Chris King, vote of thanks, please. Am I supposed to sit back over there? Yeah, come on have a seat. I'm sorry. <laughs> he may be a while. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen him before. That's why I wanted to see if I could sit down. <laughs> Do I need a microphone? Yes. Where is it? There. Thank you. So, yes, good. Actually, I began this by thinking, there's Peter talking about the fire regulations. And we know at least 700 people are likely to be watching. I hope Westminster City Council are not checking on the way in which we <laughs> deliver our fire regulations. 
And a little bit later in the in, in our in wonderful talk, I I wondered how Scott Treppel was feeling. Uh, with one, of, uh, how many times you mentioned Scott Gordon? Four. You mentioned Scott four times. I get a oh, right. I, <laughs> we're not supposed to advertise at the Royal. You know, so. No, this was a beautiful exhibit. I, I mean, the second issue is 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 much more interesting, I think, than the first issue. The 1851 56 period of imperfect material. And it was astonishing to go through it. And you look at the essays, the quality, the margins, the perfection of the stamps, the colors of the stamps, the blocks, two beautiful ladies' covers, um, the three colored frankings, these very beautiful. The, the colors of these stamps, I think, are absolutely wonderful. And I can see why you particularly have, or why we should all fall in love with them. And then, amazingly, Gordon didn't mention the Hawaii covers. I mean, there are only eight. <laughs> the Pogue cover, and uh, extraordinary. Oh, and just for a little bit of fun, a bisect with a Hawaiian stamp. Uh, unbelievable. Um, earliest use of the five cent also, I think, on the Hawaii cover. And the covers themselves, the very pretty covers. Um, Hugh Feldman pointed out that there were very few or no railway usage, usages or ship usages or sort of waterway usages. And he was very grateful that, <laughs> that something had been left for him to collect in the past. So, um, But the covers, too, uh, show an amazing eye. I mean, the, 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 collar, the, the, the stamp, the cover with the collar over there in the corner is lovely. Newspaper stamps, illustrated covers. The Barnabas Bates cover there. I, I had aspirations to buy this when it was sold in California some years ago. I didn't buy it, needless to say, because there was some crazy American that wanted to buy it. <laughs> um, the hand-illustrated covers, the courier mail, the locals, um, the mixed franking, the beaver of five cent uh, mixed franking there, the German states, the destinations, the official perforations, and ending up this wonderful display with a page or two of the first official perforations and very neatly, with a very clear full stop, uh, ending up with the one cent earliest known usages, uh, usage. No, it was, it was lovely. So a wonderful display, and, and each page has something of interest and beautifully presented all the way through. You just look at the way in which these are laid out on the page. Uh, Gordon clearly has an eye for perfection. Um, and the other thing that's wonderful is the sense of the time, the confidence in the country, the distances, greater than 3,000 mile rates, I love that. Um, you know, the population growth, the gold rush, urbanization, the size of the population increase during this period, the German-speaking cowboys out there in Santa Fe. Uh, it just gives a feel of uh, this um, young nation and this uh, second issue of stamps. So the colors, the quality, and, well, as I say, eye candy and such an eye. So, Gordon, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Um, you won the Champion of Champions, I think, um, in Connecticut? Yes. Yeah, 2014, I think, for, for this series. You say it's your first visit here, so it is your first visit here, but you're very welcome to come again. <laughs> so thank you very much indeed. This was superb. Any questions for Gordon? <coughs> yeah, question to the back, please. Yes, behind you. Oh, sorry. Chris Harmon behind you. A technical question I will try to make not too technical. Take your one cent. Presumably, it started out as a flat die, that a roller impression was taken of that flat die, 
and the roll of impression was used to lay out the plate of a hundred. Right. How do you get with one roll of impression, or were there many different impressions on the roller, different takes on the final steel plate of the design? Well, the roller had more than one uh, image on it. That, so there's a die, then the roller, just standard line engraving, the same way they, I'm sure they did it in the UK, and then they would roll it in. So they would, the problem they had is they'd start rolling it in and realize that we were going to be, they were limited by the size of the steel, excuse me, steel plate because of the, I, I understand the press, what was available at the time, how big a steel plate. So they would start, they'd give up, they'd rub it out, but they would burnish off, the, they'd put one in and then they would maybe burnish off a little bit and then they do another one, and just trying to get it to fit. So, so in, in, in effect, the, the multiple impressions on the roller, one of which was perfect, and the others no. were... No, I think all the impressions were the same on all the rollers and all the line engraved stamps. I don't think there were many differences in the impressions. So there are probably some experts here on, on line engraving, but the problem was is they would lay it down whether they would rock it all the way. So you've got a round thing and you're rocking it here, but you might stop, I'm sorry, stop a little early because you just don't have room to do the whole impression. And, and they fought with this. And, and, they, and I'm sure they had someone there understanding, you know, it's like in programming, I'd, people would come in, I could write that in a weekend. What, what's keeping you guys so long? I mean, I'm sure it was the same way there. They were under real pressure to get this job done. So, so that created the, uh, a lot of the challenges. Um, it started with a bad plan, like so many things. The stamps were too big for what they wanted to accomplish, and instead of redoing it, they created this, this issue, but it makes it interesting. Um, but it's hard for me to see that a, a cover, because it happens to have a 1B, but it's the same cover, is worth you know, $20,000 more. It's, just, it's, it's not, something about it seems funny. But I don't know if that it gets to your question, but they, um, but I believe the process was exactly the same here, right? They had a ra uh, they rolled them in on, on, a, on a press with this extreme amount of pressure. This is steel, and um, and these plates were heavy. And and if you dropped one, yeah. What um, what's amazing to me is we were talking about the the penny black and and how fast they made these. I, I, it's really astounding to me after really studying these, this, issue, this stuff with the U.S. How, how remarkable it is that this all happened in a very short period of time. And, and they were, and, and the U.K. was so much nicer to make plating easy. <laughs> I mean, Any more questions? Right down the front, exercise for Dane. Firstly, thank you, Praise, for the Penny Black. Um, some of us do enjoy it. <laughs> An unfair question, perhaps. We found in recent times it very difficult to look to records that give the detail of what went on when, in fact, under great pressure, the Penny Black was being devised and done. We found uh, printer's records now, and they are more exact, but the time before of what went on is still a, 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 an open debate. Is that the same for America when you look at the early records? Well, like we talked about, people would walk down the street and discuss things that they didn't document. Um, <laughs> smart people they were. Um, but there is a huge number of documents that are online on the U United States Classic, uh, Philatelic Classic Society website, which we've just redone, um, that 
that really do give a huge amount of the correspondence and the business dealings involved with getting these stamps done, and also the 1847 stamps. Um, there was a gentleman in the post office who saved all these. He, they, they were going to destroy him, and he felt that was wrong. So he saved him. Then he got caught up in a scandal, and it was very sad. But um, the scandal wasn't about the, the but these, the, the museum, the Postal Museum in Washington, has a very large collection, and they're all been scanned. And they're all on the uh, Classic Society website. John Barwis, I think most, many of you know John. He is a maniac when it comes to doing this stuff and scanning things and saving them online. Um, we're now working on, on a, a way of doing plating. You don't have quite the plating issue, but uh, how do we take advantage of today's technology of the internet and um, the interactivity to make and maintain the plating information easier because people pass it to each other and the, then someone passes on and uh, you know we lose so we're trying to save all that kind of stuff also not your question but but, uh, but there is a lot that we don't know yeah. it's good because we can write more papers make more stuff up and <laughs> uh, speculate on how it might have been Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not going to ask any more questions on the grounds that the cold wine's getting warm and the warm wine's getting cold. Um, is that the right way around? Maybe. Um, Gordon, that was absolutely fantastic. Oh, well, you're too thank kind. You much, that was wonderful. Please have that with our. Oh, thank you very much. A little photo with Joe. Thank you. Have a little handshake. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Right, um, next meeting, two weeks today, another American, I do think they're taking over. We have uh, David Pitts showing Bermuda, uh, another fantastic opportunity to see something which has so seldom been seen here before. Um, Gordon was mentioning websites and how useful they all are. Um, I'm actually delighted to say that uh, thanks to some, a huge amount of work by um, Mark Bailey and Steve Jarvis, we've actually signed a contract today to redevelop the Rawls website. So I'm hoping that that should be active before the end of the year. So uh, it needs an overhaul, and that has just been started as of today. So thank you for that. Um, next to the front door, there's a pile of these, which are uh, invitations to a free tea party. Why is it free? That's because our very good friends at Stanley Gibbons are sponsoring on, our, on, the, uh, on the, the effort for us. Um, it actually is exactly the same time, on exactly the same date, as John Aitchison's 148-year bash in New York. However, don't worry, because they're next door to each other. And they're both on for two or three hours. So what you do need to do is mark that in your diary. It's the afternoon of Friday the 3rd of June in New York. Um, Victoria, who's sitting in the front here, wave, <laughs> does need a little bit of a clue as to how many tea cakes to buy. So if you could possibly send her an email. Uh, <laughs> Her email address is on this little limitation. There's a big pile of these. Please take one away. And if you are going to come, it would help Victoria tremendously to work out how many cups of tea, etc., to get. So thank you, Victoria, in advance. Um, what else? Uh, an email went out a couple of days ago. It went out in my name, but it wasn't from me. And I guarantee it was not a spoof. And Patrick would just like to say a few words about that. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, that email was sent out as a result of Frank's uh, previous president's message, which you all have read very carefully. That's why we got 50 questions afterwards, um, in which it was announced that you would get three messages regarding fundraising. The first one was the survey, which was then sent out by a professional company. The second is a, um, a membership scheme. So you will be asked if you want to do voluntarily um, give more than what you need to give as um, for a membership fee. You get nothing in return, but you get eternal gratitude from the society. And uh, the third thing is um, that you will also get a physical mailing, a physical mailing with some information 
about remembering the royal in your will. So, um, is this the end of the meeting, uh, yes, Mr. Fine. President? Well, so those who feel well can go down and have the wine and, di and dinner. Those who don't feel too well can maybe have one of these brochures from me, remembering the royal in your will. Thank you very much. Um, it's now five past six. This will be in the frames for another 15, 20 minutes. Uh, so please go and enjoy a glass of wine. If you've not had a chance to look at some of these treasures here, do so. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you in two weeks' time. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>